Hi, this is the uh, start um, of our August 2020 meeting, Coast Women in Business. Thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, Catherine Marshall will take over the floor. Thank you. So our topic today is cultivating networks to build your business. And uh, we have a, a, a kind of a, we have just a, a few people participating, but uh, we'll go ahead and proceed with our program. Hi, Clara. Thanks. Um, nice <laughs> to see you. There you go. So we're just going ahead and starting here. Um, so let's see. Before we started recording, Marinella, you mentioned that Lisa had a workshop this afternoon. Did you want to mention that, Lisa? Uh, Talk yes. about that. Um, so this afternoon at four o'clock, I will be presenting. Um, uh, for the West Business Development Group, um, this is the second um, the second COVID nineteen HR webinar I think uh, that we've done. Clara, and um, you're you're here. Um, and today we'll be we will be focusing on um, you know more about um, actually having COVID cases in the workplace. So we'll be talking about what what to do if you have a case and how to pay employees, your obligations around paying employees, um, your, um, you know, from a privacy standpoint, what you can and can ask employees about their health condition. And we'll be going over the um, FFCRA, which is the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act, which um, provides paid sick leave and uh, time off for employees that meet, um, that meet the criteria for that. So, um, but, but most importantly, we're just providing an, kind of an open forum after we go over those topics to answer any questions um, related to um, HR um, and COVID-19. So that's at four o'clock today and you can register um, through the uh, West website. I also have the RSVP link in the chat box. Oh, nice. Thank very you. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> uh, Lisa, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Um, yeah, we'll just do introductions, but I'm not going to ask a question of the day because I'm going to be asking you lots of questions like that all during our presentation. So I thought we, we'd just skip that one today. Go ahead. Oh, sounds good. Um, my name is Lisa McCormick. My company is Afogado HR Consulting, and uh, we are based uh, in San Jose, but I'm here on the coast in Mendocino, and we provide HR um, consulting services to small businesses across Northern California. And I'm also an HR advisor for West. Excellent, thank you. Um, Marinella, did you want to introduce yourself? Um, well, Karen, Karen Uphoff also uh, joined. Um, Karen, do you want to introduce yourself? I, I see she did. I was just going around the, the room here. So ah, okay, go ahead. Hi, hi, <laughs> hi. Um, yes, I'm Karen Uphoff, and I'm um, a herbalist, a me medical herbalist, and body worker, and teacher. And I am consulting at Corners of the Mouth, as well as my office in town, which is open now. And oh, where yeah, are you? Yeah, are you I'm located, I'm, I'm in, I've been in the village of, I'm right behind, on Howard Street, behind the kind of across from Harvest Hardware store. Okay. It's that blue, it's in that blue two-story house that everybody sees when they park at Harvest. Oh, okay. Very good. Yeah. Good. So, yeah. Okay, Marinelli, do you want to go next? <laughs> sure. Um, I'm Marinella Miklea and I run Mendo Digital. Um, I help companies uh, become more visible online with um, search engine optimization, SEO, um, content, and social media optimization. And I'm also a consultant for the West Development, uh, West Business Development Center, um, helping companies to, um, to ramp up quickly uh, their websites as well as um, social media. And I'm, all, I'm actually going to be teaching a uh, couple of workshops in the fall for West. Um, I know one is Shopify, and hopefully the other one is either analytics or SEO. Well, I have to talk to Clara about it. Okay. Uh, Catherine, how about you? Do you want to introduce yourself? 
Uh, Catherine Rudica, my company is Creative Sage, and I help organizations scale, innovate, and grow larger and solve various leadership and marketing problems. So I also have a background in social media and fundraising and a lot of other management uh, areas too. Sarah, how about you? Hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Claire Shook, and I'm the event coordinator with West Business Development Center. I help coordinate, um, find instructors for workshops, and in particular, I'm interested, um, particularly from this group, if there's anyone here who has particular uh, trainings they'd like to see, or if they have a training that they'd like to teach with West. We are always on the lookout for new instructors to help our community members of small business owners. Thank you. And my name is Catherine Marshall, and uh, I help nonprofits achieve their mission. Um, uh, that looks like all kinds of consulting and strategic planning, board development, fundraising, and marketing. And let's see. Okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and um, go ahead and get started here. And I have a PowerPoint, so we'll try and see if we can run this one here. So again, the topic is cultivating networks to build your business. And um, this is one of my favorite topics because um, I've actually had people call me the networking queen. So these were this is my earlier days. <laughs> and the reason why is um, uh, my first consulting business that I started after working for a number of years with small business owners, I, I either managed my own businesses or um, helped other people manage, or I did their sales for small businesses. And I decided one of the biggest problems that small business owners had was um, selling and figuring out how to market themselves and, and talk about the, what they do. And so um, my first workshop I ever created for business owners as a consultant to small business owners early in my career was about sales and marketing and how to network and that kind of thing. So, um, and then I did start a nonprofit in the Bay Area called Bay Area Entrepreneur Association, which is, was networks and leads groups for entrepreneurs all over. I had like five chapters in the Bay Area that, that ran for 11 years. So I got to be, uh, a, a, kind of a, a mini guru for <laughs> business networking a long time ago. And I've, I've transferred a lot of that thinking around to nonprofits here, but I just wanted to share some of the uh, things that I've learned about this that are really tried and true um, aspects of networking that sometimes we don't think about. And I don't know if you all remember the term uh, uh, guerrilla marketing. Do you all remember that term from, from way back there? So guerrilla marketing really was that uh, lower or no cost marketing um, that really saved time and everything. And so this, this, these elements that we're talking about are really um, parts of guerrilla marketing. Uh, so the first thing I wanna ask all of you uh, is to think about uh, a really wonderful experience that you've had with a customer. Oh, and you may want to have a pencil and paper. It's up to you because we're going to write some things or think for a second. So if you have a pencil and paper, that would be good. Um, so think about for a second uh, a really great experience that you had serving a customer and how it made you feel. And, um, and I'd like if you could share of what that experience was like. Just maybe a couple of sentences. What, what was it that would made it really like a great experience for you and the customer? Give you a second, think about it. Anybody have, have an idea of one now? Oh, hi, Teresa. Let's hear from a couple of you. Um, well, uh, let's see, I'll turn. Um, I was just thinking uh, the, the experience that came up that I enjoy so much is, um, first of all, the connecting, just the deeper connecting when people feel seen and heard, but also the, uh, the word breakthrough came out when somebody is as they're telling their story suddenly 
a sudden insight comes to them about their situation and they really break through in a kind of realization and that I'm a catalyst for that um, partially just by listening. And that is an exciting moment actually. So. And they really can see that you were a vehicle for that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, and I'm asking them questions and it's the questions that are leading them to oh, those places. Yeah. That's a wonderful yeah. feeling. Yeah, um, it Lisa, is. Lisa, have you had an um, experience like that? Oh, um, lots of experiences. One, one um, that came to mind that was uh, particularly, um, I think, fulfilling for the client and for us was um, a nonprofit that uh, we worked with many years ago who had um, been struggling like a lot of nonprofits do and how to manage HR within their organization. They were really uh, too small you know, to really have internal HR. And with this particular um, uh, client, we were just able to go in there and, um, and uh, 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 work with the, their infrastructure, change their systems, um, train them to be able to manage HR um, effectively, and then, you know, provide the, uh, an external resource for them. But it was, um, it was, you know, just being able to show our value and reduce their cost and um, just add value to that organization. And um, that was one that, you know, became a good case study for our business in how we did that. And um, was there some reaction from your, your customer that said that you, you nailed it? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And then, and because I think we all felt that we, we just, um, you know, we we nailed the the, the scope of work, um, and uh, and as I said, they were willing to give testimonials and um, be part of a case study for us to, um, you know, so that we could share that with our you know future customers. And that I, that's great. It, and Teresa, did you want to introduce yourself? And um, and I don't know if you have a an idea of somebody that um, a, a customer that really. You, you got a really good feeling that you really had helped them. You're on mute right now. Harry, I don't know if you know your... I'm, you? I'm here, I can hear you. My, my connection is so bad, I don't oh. even wanna try. <laughs> okay. it, it's drawing out. So um, if I could just listen, that would be great. That would be fine, okay. Okay, thanks. Sure, so, so what we're really, trying to go for and any kind of success story or testimonial from a customer you're looking for that moment of transformation that aha moment and snag that feeling and uh, have it as an essence of your your story about how you want to describe the experience of working with you um, and hold that thought for a moment because what I find um, and I don't know if you have the same problem, but sometimes family and friends, they don't get what you do. I know when my parents were living, I tried to explain to them what I did and they looked at me and their eyes glazed over and I knew that I was not doing a good job of explaining what I do. And because uh, they weren't in that world um, of microenterprise and small business development. And so they just didn't get it. And so, um, I, I kind of failed miserably at at least getting my family to get what I did. If they, the challenge is, if they do get it, mm. do they know how to tell somebody else what you do? Mm. Okay. Now, mm. uh, I don't know if any of you, have any of you run into this situation where people that are friendly and friends, they don't really get it or, mm. yeah, or, um, and so one thing that will help because your family and friends can be a, a, a network for you. They can be a source of new business. And what I find is that we're extra shy with our family and friends um, because we don't want to look too pushy. We don't want to be too salesy. We don't want to look like we're, we're using them to get business or anything like that. But when you hang on to the idea that what you do is really transformative in the world, you change people's lives, you make their world better, then armed with that, you really feel like um, 
you know, you can say, and you can tell that story. And you, it could be as simple as describing to a friend or your family members, hey, I have this great experience with a customer the other day, here's what happened. And so they will understand better what you do if you tell that story, because they'll live through that and see what the change that you made. So I really want to support the idea that we should be really proud of what we do and not feel shy about uh, communicating to our family and friends what we do and how we change people's lives um, because they can be a wonderful source of new business for us. So that's, that's the, the, uh, the, the first kind of basic network that I think we're underutilizing. Generally, we're underutilized. Um, so thinking about that, um, you know, you've already had it, you've already told the story. Now, if you, uh, for most of us, we've got a typical customer, typical customer. And um, Karen and Lisa, why don't, and Clara, you're welcome to, to share this too, If uh, but typical customer, customer. Can you describe like a typical customer, Karen, um, for you? And, and you guys are all on yeah. mute and it's okay because we're so small. You can stay off mute if you want. Well, it's, it's yeah. um, probably the typical customer is things have gotten so difficult with their health that they finally um, feel a sense of almost despair at what do I do about this problem? Mm -hmm. And I, you know, doctors can't seem to help me and all that. And then they come to me. I mean, as herbalists, we always say we are the, in the last desperation okay. <laughs> often. So that's a common one, but it's not always true. Some people feel very empowered. Like I really want to just, improve my situation and they you know I, I sort of have two kind of customers there's the help help you know i'm i'm desperate now and then there's the i want to not become a desperate case and i'm already taking this into my own hands so it's kind of both okay and let, let me ask you more questions uh are they usually men or women usually women are they um uh What's the typical age range? Um, yeah, there's kind of like a 20s and 30s set. That's the more I want to um, do something proactively. Yeah. And then yeah. there is the 50 to 70 set. OK. All right. And um, I don't know if this makes a difference, but are they um, kind of middle class? Do they have usually wealthy? Are they kind of middle of the road um, on a fixed income? Yeah, I would say fixed income to middle class to I, I actually a fair range of income. Okay. okay. And so you have a, a basic picture. Um, and let me just ask Lisa that question too. Do you your customers, um, a typical customer for your HR practice, what would that look like for you? Um, uh, typically, our customers would be uh, small businesses who, um, who uh, are either, too, either are, are growing or not growing, but um, you know, are too small to have internal human resources support. Um, so that would be that would be the typical company of course we do have customers that come to us because something is blown up and they need help uh, you know i think we all have those kind of customers but typically they're looking for solutions they're looking for uh for guidance on um how to um you know build their hr infrastructure and how to manage hr in the organization okay now and again i'm going to ask you some deeper questions uh, do you find in a small business, uh, are, is their income a certain size? Um, you know, like, are they, they're going to be under a million dollar a year businesses typically? Uh, in terms of their, their revenue? Um, yes. Uh -huh. uh, well, it, it, um, 
Yeah, I'd say we probably have, you know, a, a mix of clients in terms of revenue. Some are startup companies, some are um, nonprofits. Um, so, yeah, I would say, you know, there's probably a good percentage of them that, um, you know, are under a million, two million in revenue. And the size of the number of employees is maybe under 10? Yeah, it, yeah, it ranges. I mean, our, our um, I would say probably our average size would be around 20, 30 employees. Okay, okay. So you all have a pretty good picture of what your typical customer, and these are folks that uh, may use you once and then maybe never call you again or something like that because you helped them over their problem and now they're off and running. Um, or they um, or are they typically repeat customers? Uh, well, so there, um, you know, it, it's a mix. But we, um, when we choose who we're going to work with, we typically want customers where we're going to have a longer term engagement with them. You know, um, we don't uh, we don't do a lot of one and done type things. If if that um, if that's what they need, we mm -hmm. might refer them to someone else type of thing so we're looking for longer longer term engagements with our with our customers okay and how about you karen well there are people i'd like longer term engagements with because then they we we could work more deeply together so it depends on people's sense of commitment i suppose but i usually have sort of middle gauge meaning they, we work together for a more um, concentrated period, maybe half a year, and then depending on what happens, um, they are kind of on their own. I mean, they, they, I don't hear from people as often. And then all of a sudden, three years later, <laughs> they pop up. Like, so I get, I get people I've had, people that have been clients for 20 years and it's only every few years they um contact me for help mm -hmm. so there's that kind of and and it's also a little comp i mean it's complicated by the fact that i'm a nutritional consultant at corners and so people who are local sometimes just check in through the store nice. okay. yeah so um, so you all have a pretty good idea, but you uh, of who your your typical customer is. Uh, but oftentimes they sometimes just buy once, and then you might it might be a little bit before they buy again. These kinds of things, so it's sporadic. And um, I'm kind of um, in the same boat as a, somebody that's a consultant to nonprofits. So I'll just give an example. So I. Um, a lot of times, uh, there are a lot, especially around here, Mendocino nonprofits, most of them are small. Um, they have a board and maybe one or two staff. They're pretty, pretty tiny. And they might hire me to do uh, strategic planning. And they may, like maybe the following year, say, oh, you know, would you do a board development uh, retreat for us or something like that? And so, and that's fine. And uh, once in a while, I'll get a referral from one nonprofit. To to another um, but what I found was uh, and I found this early on in, in my career is that um, if I were going to market and I can do things like send newsletters to former customers and other nonprofits that are in the area just to keep my name out there and that's one kind of guerrilla marketing kind of technique but um, identifying what I call an ideal customer which is another level of a, a customer that would repeat repeatedly buy from you or repeat or refer others to you and so if you um instead of marketing to the end user you market to the level that is a referring customer or a referring um uh, network then you actually are utilizing your marketing time a little bit better and for me what i found was marketing to foundations and to associations of nonprofits um, uh, made a huge difference. Um, for example, um, uh, some of you are familiar with community action agencies. Um, so, you know, we have a community action agency in Ukiah. Um, and so 
uh, there's there's one in every county in California, and you can imagine across the country. So I work with the Association of Community Action Agencies in California and the Community Action Agencies in National, and I have contracts with both of them. And so they invite me to their conferences. I get a lot of exposure to a lot of community action agencies all over the country. And I end up having repeat um, activities uh, and repeat business with those that, um, the, where those associations position me. So like for the National uh, Community Action Agency, they had me doing coaching for several community action uh, agencies around the country, including one that was in Sonoma County. And uh, Sonoma County, uh, they then hired me separately to do a um, strategic planning session. And then they referred me to the Napa County Community Action Agencies. You see how that works? And so um, I wasn't actively marketing through all the community action agencies. I was marketing to the associations. And so, if you stopped and thought um, who would be an ideal customer for you, I want you to just do some thinking here. Hopefully you've been thinking while I've been chattering away, but who would, re who would refer you repeatedly or who would be a source of repeat business for you? Um, or who's, um, uh, who would refer people? Um, so there could be an, uh, somebody that could buy from you over and over again, or refer people over and over again. Have you have you thought about um, doing that? I'm carrying your, your your corners of the mouth might be a a good spot for that uh, as an idea. But uh, have you thought about sources of people that would refer you regularly, Karen? Are you still there? I am. There you go. I'm sorry. I had to go get water. And um, yeah, I do get referrals through corners, but I also have patients who um they you know they i i help them with their health it was successful they might still be taking a tincture or tea i make and they tell their friends that oh you know she really helped me I don't do much advertising okay yeah Okay, and so there may be some characteristics as I kind of, um, quizzed you on the characteristics of your typical customer. There may be a characteristic of your referring customer that you might want to think about what makes that person different. And then how do you um, cultivate uh, that kind of a customer? So you might want to think about that. Yeah. Um, uh, Lisa, have you had some thoughts about how to be sources? Um, yeah, um, a lot of thoughts around this. Um, we um, we spend we don't spend a lot of time on marketing. We spend more time on building um, um, our what we call our consulting partners, um, and for exactly that for referrals. So um, we have um, we get a lot of referral business from. Um, uh, finance and accounting professionals, right, okay. who are also in these small businesses, right? So what do these small, small businesses already have, right? Um, so we get referrals from accounting and finance people, um, uh, insurance brokers. Um, so we have, a, we have a pretty good network of people who um, understand what we do and uh, we understand what they do. Um, so that's been so that's been our biggest source of referrals. And again, we're you know a lot of our business is um, is also word of mouth. Um, but having these trusted advisors, you know, in our network um, has been the best way for us to grow for our business. So I think that's kind of what you're going to be talking right. about here today too, right? right? Is is that's where you know you want you know. The less marketing that you have, the better. Right? Getting getting the getting referred from somebody that is trusted is probably going to result in a uh, you know a sale more than somebody who just you know sees your right. website and calls you. So that's where we spend our time, um, and attorneys as well. So kind of attorneys, finance, um, uh, insurance uh, brokers, and and then anybody else you know who. Um, uh, 
you know, that works with small businesses. Excellent. like me. So, and we're going to talk a little bit more about about that um, aspect of a referral network too, um, just in the very next one. But I wanted to check in with uh, Marinella and with Catherine um, to see if they've had any experience um, creating what I'm calling an ideal customer that's a, re a referral network or referring customer or one that um, buys from you repeatedly as opposed to just a typical customer that you should do once. Any thoughts? Well, I'm going to say more about that in my, my presentation, but um, yes, I've had a number of situations like that. And uh, one thing I'm going to say is that you need to find the hub people in your network and really be clear on who those people are and cultivate those relationships so they're reciprocal, so that you're helping them and they're helping you and you build up trust. And so the best, I've had a number of people in my hub like that, and uh, you know we've, we've referred each other, not only to clients, but to resources. So you know you have to draw a balance somewhere between giving away everything, but you, there are always resources you can share, like a relevant article for them. You can send it to them. You know you can do a Zoom call with them periodically and just kind of do idea brainstorming, anything that you're aware of that would be helpful to them, and that can just be support. You know it it can be really simple and basic. Thank you. How about you, Marinella? You know, I'm still figuring this out <laughs> um, because what I do, it, it can okay. be very technical and um, that's, uh, that's been a stumbling block for a lot of my clients in understanding um, what I do, um, what I will do for them. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why a lot of the time I've, I describe the benefit rather than actually state what I do. Um, okay. Probably, you know, partners, um, they, they, partners, uh, so people who are doing similar things to what I do, um, similar line, lines of business, where we're not competing for each other's customer base, but uh, uh, providing complementary um, services. Those have been the best uh, referral partners for me. I think you all are getting into the next thing here that I'm going to be talking about here. So I'm going to scoot into that one. And I realize I'm I gotta make sure I'm watching my time here. So this, this, um, so that what you all are hitting on, you, you all sound like you're experts and you can give this workshop yourself. So I'm really glad. Um, one thing I wanted to make sure, um, uh, and this is one thing that kind of stops people short a little bit, but it, it sounds like most of you have a sense of that is if you understand the moment when people make a decision to buy a service like yours, um, what I call the buying moment, if you understand when they buy, how, how they're feeling, what emotion, because um, as much as you would rather not um, agree with this, most people, most purchases that we make um, elicit some emotion. They, they satisfy something that we are craving for. Um, whether it's, it's just to look better, feel better, uh, have more money, you know, these, you know, what are people experiencing? So if you have a thorough understanding of when um, uh, people buy from you and how they're feeling, then you're going to get a better sense of who is a good partner for you in the buying moment. And so what Lisa mentioned uh, is, is and, and, and um, Catherine and certainly Marinella too, that um, you, you know, if you have partners that are, um, and let me just go to this next slide here. If you have partners that experience this, um, this the customers at the same need level, then, um, so, and actually share um, customers. And, um, and, and again, early in my um, career, I was, I did sales for, um, I did sales for a lot of different companies, the small businesses, but one of them was an interior landscape company, you know, the kind that put plants in hotels and office buildings and things like that. And I've also done exterior landscaping as well. But 
Um, what I decided when I became the like full-time salesperson just for an interior landscaping company, I formed my own network of other building services. So, and they were all women, um, just coincidentally. But um, you know, one was sold a janitorial service, another one uh, sold exterior landscaping, another one sold air conditioning building services. And so we get together um, for monthly coffees and share leads. And um, we all had to trust each other that all of us were producing quality work and we could, knew that if we referred them to our own customer, that they were gonna do a good job. So nobody was in the group that we had any shakiness about or that was new and we didn't know what they were like. So, uh, and then we also helped each other out. Just like what Catherine says, we share information and resources. Um, they say, hey, I see a building going up um, you know, in Santa Clara and it looks like you know, it's gonna be offices and maybe they're gonna need janitorial services. So if I have an appointment with uh, the property manager um, or the, the, the people that are gonna be buying the building, um, I say, oh, by the way, I, I have colleagues that I've already vetted that are, are, have these good exterior landscaping and they can do your janitorial. So I give them business cards for, uh, for my um, network. And same thing, they would share information. Hey, there's, uh, they're looking, for, these people are dissatisfied with their interior landscaping. Here, go get them. <laughs> you know, they call me up. So, um, so I cultivated those folks and expressed appreciation. Sometimes I took somebody out for lunch if they gave, if I got a nice contract, that kind of a thing. So it's, it was a very intentional network that I formed around uh, folks that uh, would have customers that were at the same buying moment as me. And um, so that's, uh, that was really one of my aha moments that has really helped me over the years, is making sure that I'm uh, working with people that are like-minded, that do quality work, and I feel comfortable referring them. And that relationship that we build over the years um, is really something that'll serve you long-term. And it is some basic guerrilla marketing. So I, I'm gonna stop now and I need to, to be quiet so Catherine can <laughs> talk. So I'm gonna do that. And I'm sorry if I stepped into, I don't know if I'm using your time, but. Oh, I, I don't know, okay. it's okay, I think. <laughs> So I'm going to go a, a few steps beyond what Catherine said and talk also if you have a business already, and, and this can apply to nonprofits as well, um, how you use networking to scale and to innovate and go into new areas. Because a lot of times you need to have more markets. You need to open up a new market, especially if you've been in business for 20 years or more. And um, so one thing I wanted to say about these hub people is if you can draw a diagram where you connect dots, literally sometimes it helps to think visually, you can identify who those people are. And I'm going to talk a little bit about strategic networking and serendipitous networking because both are really important and you can use them in different ways. So part of the thing is to recognize opportunities and that requires using your imagination. Some things are not obvious. So never make assumptions about people. I've gotten referrals from people I wouldn't have purposely chosen to network with. I've gotten referrals from people who completely surprised me and they were absolutely wonderful. They referred me to a great project or some resource or a new partner. Um, uh, we, could, we could go into forming ventures at some point and collaboration, which is also a really big topic. Um, so I'll just touch on that a little bit. So I mentioned a net etiquette, and Catherine touched on this too. You want to always thank people. And what you want to do is think long term. You don't want just a one-off casual relationship with people. You want to let them know that you're interested in them as a person. Because even on social networks, behind every one of those avatars or pictures is a human being. And so you might have specific areas that you share as far as work, but it really helps to get to know the whole person because it's easier to then form a deeper long-term relationship with them and develop trust. Because mutual trust is really what it 
what it uh, makes. So right now we see where we have, I had a, a screen share like this, but we can use this one. You see all these dots. So locate your hub people. And then an exercise might be to, um, first of all, the referral partners, but also to come up with idea people. People on the edge, maybe, of your network you might not talk to very often can sometimes give you the most creative feedback if you're trying to come up with new ideas for your business or you're trying to innovate. People in other industries can sometimes spark an idea in you. So never make assumptions and find both the hub people that immediately make sense and then some people who don't make immediate sense. Like who can you call in the next week who sort of interests you but you don't see an immediate benefit for yourself, but they're interesting. Uh, I, I guarantee some wonderful things will happen from doing that. Uh, friend, I, I have to ask, is, is everybody else just have a blank screen that I have a blank screen? Or I, is I can see the slide. The slide. Likewise. Oh, goodness. Okay, well, I've got a problem, so I'll work on that. Sorry to disturb you. So networking has really brought me so much. I, you know, I was making a list of the things that it's brought me and not only in person networking, but online networking. And if you do online networking right, you're forming relationships, you're having conversations. You're not just using them to promote things. Um, a mistake I see often, I have quite a few followers on Twitter, for instance, or Facebook, and um, a lot of times I get messages from people and they say, can you tweet or post whatever they're trying to promote? And first of all, I'm not just a media person. I, you know, I, I have other reasons maybe to promote what they're saying and maybe not. And the other thing is you never do an ask like that in your first contact with people. I have organizations doing fundraising all the time and they annoy me by asking me for money right away before they've built any kind of connection with me. And I think that's a major mistake that nonprofits make a lot. But business people do it too. I have people on LinkedIn all the time who hit me up for jobs and, you know, or, or they want this referral or that and I don't even know them. You know, and the obvious question is, why should I do that? Now, maybe they would be a good person for me to get to know, but they have to give me quickly in summary format, you know, some reasons why they're connecting with me. And then we need to have a couple of conversations, usually several at least. You know, maybe we set up a time for a Zoom phone call now or something um, before maybe you went out for coffee. But if you're networking with people all over the world or in different states or countries, you can't do that. So you have to come up with other ways to connect with people. And if you've already developed a relationship with them, then it's much easier to ask for help to ask for a referral, uh, to give them support in a way they might need it. So you, you can never be too, um, you, you always remember your manners. Think about how you relate to people in person. So what networking has brought me? Well, I don't think I'd have a business without networking. I very rarely ever have had to pay for advertising. And I've been in business for over 30 years. I've been in business in different industries. I've crossed industries. I would not have been able to change clients, um, ideal clients, or move into other areas if I didn't network. And I will tell you that I'm actually a shy person, you know, and I used to not want to go to in-person networking things because I was scared. Well, I'm still scared, but I have learned how to be a really good networker on a very personal level and also online. And I can tell you that I've gotten so many benefits. So some of the benefits are that I've been able to hire people to help me scale at times when I've had big projects or I was just moving my business to another level. I've been able to find people. Um, I, when I couldn't afford employees all the time and you really do have to know the independent contractor laws for your state, I've worked with contractors and I've had excellent results. Um, you know, I've learned about when you use interns and when it's better not to use interns. And even the intern relationships I developed through networking. 
So I got a glimpse of how someone might be as an intern before I brought them on. Um, I've been a contributing author to three business books that were all on the Amazon bestseller list. Uh, two of them were the landmark Age of Conversation books. Uh, there were one, two, and three. And I was in two and three. I contributed chapters. And then a guide to open innovation and crowdsourcing, advice from leading experts. Well, these were leading innovation experts from all over the world. And I would not have had any of those opportunities if I were not on Twitter, because that's where it started, was on Twitter. A lot of people balk at Twitter, but if you know how to use Twitter well, the world opens up to you. And generally for business, the pattern I followed is if someone seems like a serious business interest, I've gone from Twitter over to their LinkedIn and then joined a group that they're in or continued a conversation there. Um, if I go and join with them on Facebook, it's usually not my personal page. It's, it's company pages. So it's like company to company. And certainly you want to have presences in, a vis in visual formats or where you can explain concepts like YouTube, Vimeo, or Instagram. There are a number of others. But it all should work off of a hub and your website. And so the whole thing is that I wouldn't have been able to contribute to any of those books if people didn't know who I was, like a lot of people. And one way to do that is to get on Twitter lists. Um, I, for about nine years now, have been on the Innovation Top 50 list on Twitter. And I've connected to every one of those people on LinkedIn and many of them on Facebook to their companies. Um, I've also been in Twitterville, which was a landmark book by Shell Israel, where he interviewed me about a project I had with Sutter Health that won an international award for social media and community building. And so, you know, then I started getting a lot of media interviews from my online connections. Um, you know, there are many press people I know in person, but I made sure that I followed them on social networks, on Twitter and LinkedIn especially. And so the thing about doing press nowadays is that you're not so much pitching something as you're cultivating those relationships and having an eye for exactly when you should pitch a certain idea, but you do it in a conversational way with them. So to do that, you really have to be smart about seeing opportunities and looking at the media in, in different ways than you might have before. So that takes knowledge. Um, another opportunity, I just mentioned the Sutter Health Project. That was one of many examples where uh, someone I met through a women's consulting group in Silicon Valley had a healthcare project. She was a kind of a traditional healthcare media relations person. And people at Sutter Health wanted to do a social media project for a new hospital they were building. And it was very controversial in the community. I mean, there were people who loved it and hated it. And they did have the insight to realize that they should get on social media and do community building that way. So she had heard about me. I think this was about a third dot down on the, on the hub, if you did the connect the dots. So through three or four referrals, she came to me and um, asked me if I would be like the social media project person, the community, community building person. So I became a project manager for that. Um, I partnered with her. It took us over six months to land the project. We did two sets of proposals. We had to have two vice presidents sign off on it. What was really cool was it ended up not going through the marketing department. It ended up going through the CEO of the hospital and the architecture department, the people who were actually building this hospital. So it was an amazing project. And through social media contacts, it was nominated for a Snicker Award, which back then was um, Society for New Communications Research. Now it's part of the conference board. They merged. And I got to fly to Harvard, go to Harvard University, and accept this award um, on behalf of Sutter Health. And then the good thing about that is I networked within the Sutter Health Organization. And our project, which lasted for about two years, became the pilot project for all the Sutter Health hospitals. 
So they took what we did and it became the prototype. So the thing about that is none of that would have happened without networking. And it was some of the people on the edges of my network that brought that project to me. I was not well known in um, healthcare at that point. I did get other healthcare projects after that. I started out in arts and entertainment, and then I landed some tech projects earlier on. And I would not have done that had I not thought, oh, this person interests me. They work for Apple, you know, or they do marketing for Xerox or, you know, a number of the projects I worked on. So um, it's, it's like constantly being aware of people who might be on the edge of your networks. They say that innovation happens at the edges, and that is so true. So you have to be open to diversity, network with people who aren't like you, network with people you don't necessarily agree with on everything. I mean, I think to some degree you have to have similar core values, but you can network with people who don't look like you, who think differently than you, and it will bring you a world of opportunities. So in addition to these books, I got a lot of media coverage. I did a, I've done a lot of podcast interviews, video interviews, um, you know, traditional press interviews, TV shows, um, and a lot of it started out actually on social networks. And then I met some of the people in person that I could, you know, I try to meet people whenever I, like people would fly in from other cities, um, you know, when I was living in San Francisco and Berkeley, and I would uh, meet up with them. I'd make a point of trying to go out to a meal with them or get together with them for coffee. I invited some people over to my artist studio, and they liked that, you know, and, and immediately they saw me in a creative atmosphere and they became more playful and creative and so it was easier to connect with them on multiple levels. So another, another thing I wanted to say is besides strategic networking, there's what I call ruckus, random collisions of unusual suspects. And I am now on a team, a ruckus team, for the Business Innovation Factory, which is based in Providence, Rhode Island, but they have they do projects all over the country, and right now they have a, a really a healthcare project that's getting a lot of national attention um, to help women of color who are pregnant, especially during COVID, and uh, they do all sorts of innovation projects though. So I got to do that because I was on Twitter, and I met some of the people on their staff. And I uh, saw that they were doing a conference. So I wasn't going to that particular conference that year. I think that was about 2016 or so. So I tweeted. I saw that they were actually tweeting the conference. And I'd retweet something and I watched what they said. And, you know, I earmarked some time because I thought what they were doing was really interesting. And um, then I wrote a blog post about it. Well, the upshot was. They asked me for four years in a row to come to their conferences. And I made sure that I networked ahead of the conference by seeing who the attendees were and kind of getting a picture of what do they each do, who would be interesting to meet especially. But what I found that was really wonderful was when I got to their conferences, which were on the East Coast, the ruckus effect came into play, random collisions of unusual suspects. I'd find myself sitting next to someone, for instance, who worked in education, and I'd get an incredible insight from them. And then I actually had worked on some education projects, so we were able to talk about that. I sat next to people in different fields. I met a, a man who was a general in the army. I had fascinating conversations with him about innovation. Not a person I would actually usually work with, but you know, it was really quite eye-opening. So never make assumptions, look for serendipity, you're thrown together in a line with someone and start talking to them, and you might find some amazing opportunity if you keep your eyes open for the opportunity. You listen carefully and you let them talk. Be sure you let them talk. So um, the Ruckus team, and now uh, doing something larger, another concept is networking your networks together. I'm now helping a company called Reach Scale in Boston build an international network of networks of people who are doing incredible global impact projects in other countries, 
in India, in African countries, in countries where I haven't even been, but I'm, I'm attending conferences and partic participating in them now. And I'm also keeping in touch with the people that I'm meeting, even though they're in other countries. I don't speak all of their languages. Actually, most of them speak English really well, which is something that we Americans need to be aware of. But um, using the, the random collisions of unusual suspects, I, I didn't resist this. I was open to, he said to me, well, can you get up at 3 a.m. and go to these two conferences because it's 3 a.m. Pacific time. And I said, sure. <laughs> and I, I got up and participated in them. So I'm now working with Reach Scale, which is based in Boston, um, in building global networks to make real differences in scale organizations, usually social enterprises. Um, sometimes nonprofits, but usually for-profit social enterprises that originate in those countries. Many of them are led by women and people of color. So it helps to always learn about the cultures of the people that you're working with and be very sensitive to them. So that's about the most I had to say right now about all of this. Um, I had some visuals, but I think that I wanted to just say all of this because Catherine had pretty good visuals. And um, an exercise you could do actually is take the dots and as I mentioned, find your hub people, people who might be referral partners, people who might be collaborators. And we could do a whole other session on um, forming collaborations and venture partners because that's really important. There's some special distinctions about networking with partners. And then locate your people on the edges, people, ruckus people, people you wouldn't connect with normally. Maybe you're interested in an artist. Maybe you're interested in someone in a field that you don't work in, but you're, they're just an interesting person. Somebody who's not like you, someone who doesn't look like you, someone who maybe has different kinds of ideas, and just get in conversations with them. It can be no pressure, you just get in conversations. And then network your networks together. Who in one business network that you have might be wanting to meet somebody in another kind of network? It can be a personal network or a social good network. I've been on boards of nonprofits, and another thing that networking has really helped me do is raise m literally millions of dollars for nonprofits. But sometimes just being on a board, you, there are people you might meet. You have to watch out for the conflict of interest rules, of course, you know, for your state. There are laws about that. But just for networking, somebody that you sit on a board with might refer you to someone else that you might want to meet. So. There are many ways to do that. Always have your ears to the ground. Look for opportunities. Think about how you can help solve problems. Catherine, that was fascinating. I love that ruckus term. <laughs> it's random collisions and unusual suspects. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, we are, uh, are there any questions? I just want to make sure because you, you um, gave us a lot of information. I just want to make sure, does someone have any questions about? Um, so be sure to unmute and ask. And I didn't see anything in the chat. Uh, yes, actually. Sure. Hi, uh, uh, Catherine. So what do you propose for people who now during COVID, everything is virtual at this point and probably will be for quite some time. What do you recommend for young entrepreneurs who are either just coming out of college or high school and don't actually have any quote-unquote real work real world experience how would you recommend that they approach these people that they want to start networking in because so often i hear from from entrepreneurs you know that they reached out that they sent an email that they 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 made a gesture and they hear nothing back and what would you recommend for those people well, I've had young people approach me who I ended up hiring for at least projects. And they did a lot of the things that uh, Catherine and I have both mentioned. You know, maybe they, they said, hi, I'm really interested in what you're doing. Here's an article I read recently. Like they did some research 
on my company. What I find too often with young people is they don't really research enough uh, the person that they're trying to network with. And now on social media, it's so easy to research people. You can find out a lot about them. You know, maybe look at their LinkedIn profile, look at, look at them if they have a Twitter profile, go all over the place and, and look at them in different situations. So I would say the basic principles of, you know, not just, not just giving a pitch right away, develop a relationship, send resources, you can ask if you can take them out for coffee or something. I know that young people don't have a lot of money, so I never expect them to take me out for meals or anything like that. Um, that's when we can do that in person again. Uh, but you can do the equivalent of that by just asking, do you have 15 minutes to do a Zoom call? I'm really interested in what you're doing. And then maybe say why they're contacting me. Thank you. Sure. Wonderful, great question. Um, and that's also a good question for small businesses that are just starting out too, you know, so that's wonderful. Other questions? Fascinating. Um, um, I, just, I do want, I want to mention to... Uh, September the 10th is our next. Yeah. I just wanted to say that I think um, Catherine um, would be, um, it would be a great idea if Catherine um, does a presentation either for us, for Ghost Women Business, or for uh, West on Twitter, because um, I, I noticed Catherine's activity on Twitter uh, quite a while ago, and I'm always so impressed in seeing how active she is, and she always finds the right um, the right tone in her um, in her messages. Um, so I think um, you know, workshop dedicated to Twitter would would actually be really good for um, for uh, businesses to find out about. Thanks. I agree. I agree. I made a note. I was going to reach out to you, Catherine, to talk about Twitter because uh, well, that's, you know, I'm, I'm finding the value of Twitter personally now that I never saw before. I stayed away from it and I find now I get a lot of my news, a lot of my information, um, but I haven't used it for my business yet. So I, I uh, agree that that would be a great topic. Twitter. Twitter lists and how to use them, that's a very crucial element of Twitter. Uh, chats, joining, but you have to be picky about which chats you join and, and learn about the people who are running them. Uh, hashtags, I think we're used to using hashtags now. I got on, I was one of the first, I think, thousand people on Twitter, so I was what they call an early adopter. And actually through my network, I was invited to, to be on Twitter. And so I kind of was testing it in the beginning. So I learned very early on. And then when, when um, the list came in, like each feature they added, I, I was able to kind of explore right away because I would get the first rollout of it. And that was true for a while on Facebook too. And so, um, you know, I, I found myself learning each social network kind of independently of the others, but then seeing how the flow went. The network can go in a flow from one network to another. And so my approach to social media, I think, is a lot more holistic than a lot of people would use. And I credit that to being on it early when there weren't, you know, tons of celebrities, there weren't political arguments all the time, um, you know, things like that. And you could really zero in on, say, the 100 people you wanted to know, or the five chats or three chats that were key for you, you know, at a given time. So, uh, but you can still do that. It can still be a village like that if you know how to use it. Other questions? Okay. All right. So I did just want to point out um, on September the 10th, our topic is going to be retooling your business for COVID-19. And uh, our two panelists, uh, we love both of them. Uh, Christy Olson Day is going to be talking about how she's adapting the uh, gallery bookshop. I continue to buy books there because I love them so much. I hope everyone else does too. Uh, and the other person is Julia uh, Kendrick Conway. We all know she moved to Arizona, but she's um, still managing the catering and some other other businesses. So 
she's going to talk about the industry she works in and how people are adapting. <coughs> and um, Clara, I, I looked up uh, on West Company. They have some um, really great programs coming up. I saw one, I just, uh, and I'm sure you can talk about it, but do you have a whole series on the fundamentals of PR? Did you want to talk about that or any of the others? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we do have some really exciting series coming up in September. But before we get into September, I do want to give a call out for the workshops that we have coming up next week and the week after. In particular, um, I'd like to mention the fact we have a ABCs of email marketing campaigns on Tuesday, August 18th, and I'm happy to email everyone all the information I'm about to say, put it in the chat. I'll get it to you however I possibly can, whatever the easiest way it is. But uh, so next Tuesday, August 18th from three to four, we have the ABCs of email marketing campaigns. And that's gonna go over the fundamentals on uh, tips and tricks on how to improve your emailing marketing campaign or just how to start out if you're not even sure how to start out. In addition to that, I also wanna mention we have a working and learning from home workshop. Uh, it will be strategies for the working parent teaching their kids. I know distant learning has did then a, another shift in our in our COVID related life right now. And so we are creating a specific workshop. It'll probably be a couple of workshops dedicated for those working parents trying to figure out how to help their kids while also maintaining their, their work or their business from home. And that's going to be on Wednesday, August 19th from four to five. Um, and then next, the week after we have our emergency preparation for your business. Even though we have COVID going on, we're getting into fire season. And it's really important that everyone be prepared. Even on the coast, I think it's important that we be prepared for a natural disaster and making sure that we have everything in order, that we have all of our paperwork and we're prepared for that. And we make sure that our insurance is up to date. You know, it, it will take you through all of those fundamentals. And that's gonna be on Tuesday, August 25th. I also wanna mention that we have the ABCs of cybersecurity. Uh, again, we're all now in a virtual world, and so it's really more important than ever that we're making sure that we're staying safe, that we're not accidentally opening emails that we shouldn't be opening or sending information to people that aren't actually who they say. And this is going to, again, go over those fundamentals of how we make sure it's going to be taught by Tom Jacobson, the uh, owner and founder of AreWeSafeYet.net. And that's, that's gonna be most of August. And then, yes, um, uh, Catherine, thank you for mentioning. In September, we have an exciting PR series coming up. And this is taught by a duo who are both experts and professional PR um, associates in their own business. And they're gonna be taking everyone through what is PR? A lot of people aren't familiar. You know, it's a term that you sort of hear thrown around. And I don't know about you, I always associate with like New York City or LA. But the fact of the matter is small business owners can benefit from PR. And so that's going to take you through how to, how to get a PR pitch ready. Can you do PR yourself? Do you want to maybe take it to a firm? How can they help get your word out, not just to hundreds, but to millions? Series coming up on cooperatives. A co-op, how to or why you might want to think about starting a co-op. And co-ops are, are much more than our, our beloved you know, local grocery store or REI. It's something that can really benefit small business owners if they band together, they share their vision, they share their ideas, and they can achieve incredible things. But don't want to overwhelm anyone too much. Those are just the highlights that I wanted to mention. And I'll go ahead and throw some of those RSVP links in the chat box. And again, I'm happy to email this information to anyone. It's on the West website, it's on Facebook, it's, it's everywhere I can think to put it. So be there and come and enjoy the Wonderful. conversation. Thank you. Uh, so I think we're, we've come to uh, our, our closing time. Uh, any last thoughts, uh, Marinella or Catherine? Um, and I did just wanna mention that um, uh, Marinella and Catherine and I are on the steering committee. We're always looking for good topics. Uh, we appreciated people's ideas about possibly um, circulating a survey um, and see if we can get some more feedback. So uh, your thoughts about that is always appreciated. And with that, um, I'll just uh, appreciate everyone coming today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for a great presentation.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>